I was so shocked. My jaw was on the floor. Live action requires a, a small army of people. You've like become kind of obsessed with seagulls. Especially when you're making a project, I guess, for that time it consumes you. What's wrong with me? There were definitely times where we got a bit lost. I need this part of my life to be over so I can get to the next thing and say, no, like it's finished. I'm, I'm not touching it anymore. Yeah, definitely. Definitely has been, been a journey. <laughs> we're on the same wavelength here. Radea is a talented young filmmaker based in Perth, Western Australia. He is the director and the main animator for his award-winning new short film called Bird Drone. I was fortunate enough to attend the WA Made Film Festival where Bird Drone won the Audience Choice Award. And then the, the, the next week, I also watched Bird Drone win Best Australian Short Film at the, the Best Australian Short Film competition and taking home an incredible $30,000 prize. Thank you for taking some time out of your weekend and, and joining me for this. Well, thank you so much for having me. And yeah, so it's lovely to have this chat and yeah it's so cool that you were you were there on both occasions so yeah <laughs> thank you so much for the very lovely intro <laughs> It was it was so funny because obviously like when when I got to the best Australian short film competition I, I saw you and and your dad and everything in the audience and I thought okay I, I think Bird Drone's gonna be shown today <laughs> then you know and then as each of the films came, like once they got into the the animation awards and Bird Drone wasn't there I was like okay they're saving Bird Drone for the end or something <laughs> that's so interesting because like when. The two anim like the best animation award was the only one that I ever thought Bird Drone could even have a chance of winning. And so when <laughs> neither of the ones were Bird Drone, I was like, okay, well that's it then. So yeah. like, when they made but I was so shocked. I my mouth was like my jaw was on the floor, so <laughs> yeah. Did they tell you beforehand or was the announcement on stage was that the first time you heard about it? That was the, the absolute yeah, first time. It oh was, wow, okay, yeah, cool. Def, def, like yeah. genuine shock for me, so yeah. <laughs> That's so cool. That's so cool. How long have you wanted to be a filmmaker and when did you make the decision to actually become one? So like what were the first steps? Yeah, well, I remember wanting to actually make films probably around towards the end of primary school i mean i've always loved like watching movies and animation mm -hmm. and that thing but then i definitely like very distinctly remember um you know making movies in the iMovie when you're using shitty green screen effects and you know yeah. just just playing around but you know really wanting to get into that space and then not having a film camera or anything like that so using my dad's like macbook air webcam and you know <laughs> running around and recording things and you know, not not great content, but you know, it was just the start of my filmmaking journey. But then I started to then learn like how to use certain like software, like including, you know, I guess the Adobe Creative Cloud Suite because we had those on our like, school computers. And then when I started to kind of learn how to create visuals, I was then able to find a different way to express my storytelling rather than, you know, a webcam <laughs> you know I, I, I was found like a limitless area where I could create anything I wanted and so mm -hmm. that's where I started to develop my my skills and so yeah then started creating animated content through there but then learning I went I mean went to uni and then studied screen arts and marketing there so then also got to do a bit of the live action side there and yeah. meet like minor people and so yeah that's how it all yeah it came about <laughs> Yeah, that's cool. It, it is always fun to, to think back to the those very first few days, like the first time that you like hold a camera or the first time that you just make anything. And it's always it's always a bit weird and a bit messy and that thing. But and, and you just work with yeah, whatever you can, with you just like an iPad camera or whatever it might be. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you know, it's, it's nice to see how far you, you come from that and, and to look back and laugh at it and yeah, just, you know, reminisce. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's it. You got into the animation part of it really early on or was it, you know, was it like animation first or was it, you know, like live action film cameras first or anything like that? When I started out my filmmaking journey, I wanted to go into live action first. So uh, okay. like that was yep. like, uh, kind of, you know, started, uh, you know, uh, running around, getting my brother to act and my mom to act and, and, and then, I'd, you know, set... <laughs> I'd, I'd do some acting myself, even though I'm, I'm awful, even to this day, I, I can't act. That was, I, I definitely wanted to go down that route. But then, I guess realizing that, you know, I don't really have the knowledge or the skills or, you know, the ability at this level, 
But then also realizing that animation was something that I could learn and I could get a, a grasp of. And I was actually also like drawn in through like VFX. Like I was mm -hmm. really interested in how they were able to make like, you know, CGI and all that. And I'd watch like breakdowns in my spare time. And so that's also part of the reason why I started learning software. And yeah, and then, and then I mean, I've always also loved you know, animation and growing up watching, you know, Studio Ghibli and Pixar and all that good stuff. It very naturally felt, felt right to me, but I love, I love both. And so animation has almost just been out of like, I guess my comfort zone as well. And also being able to create things that I wouldn't be able to feasibly in, in live action. Like mm -hmm. for example, a film set in space, it's like, you know, if you want to have that level of believability, I think you might have to have a, a bit of a higher budget or you know some more resources than in an animation where you can put a few dots on a screen and suddenly you're in space. So yeah, yeah. where li live action requires a, a small army of people. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> can you give us a quick synopsis of what Bird Drone is about, and can you also tell us about some of the underlying meaning and the themes behind it? Yeah, so Bird Drone is about a lonely seagull looking for love, who struggles to come to terms with the fact that is newfound object of affection is a human operated drone with a limited battery life. The animated tale of unrequited love between a seagull and a drone. And what I love about the film is that there's, I feel like a lot of different interpretations or like messages you can take away from it. Definitely one that was very obvious in service level. It, to the fact to the point where we, I don't really focus too much on it when I was making it was interaction of human and humans and technology and, and nature how that all transpires throughout the film. But also, you know, I really was focused on one side of love, how universal that is. The, the message I was wanting to get to, to want viewers to take out of it really changed as I was creating the film and the, the film had like a different ending to begin with. And then over time it got more hopeful and the more I thought about it, I was like, you know, with Unrequited Love, like, Based on personal experience, the best thing you have to do is to, to move on. And so I wanted to, to be about that and to focus on that, like the bittersweetness of, of moving on, but also knowing that, you know, experiences that don't work out can lead to, to bigger and better things. And, you know, there's that chain reaction or butterfly effect of, you know, if this may have happened and that might have sucked, but, you know, it created this new opportunity. That's like one of, one of the parts that or like interpretations that I wanted people to take from it, but also finding yourself in that introspection and Seagull was alone this whole time with this drone, but you know, had a lot of great experiences along the way. And so, you know, it's, yeah, I guess a, a, a few of those things about relationships and yeah, I guess finding love and, and what, what all that means and just, mm -hmm. yeah. But I just love the concept in itself. And when I first was uh, approached uh, about it, you know, I just fell in love because, you know, it's such a cute concept to see go fall in love with the drone, but also like <laughs> so inherently tragic because as humans, we know that, you know, that can only be one sided. And so we're following this character who discovers that. And yeah, I just, I, yeah, loved the idea. <laughs> now that I've managed to luckily see it a couple of times and, you know, sort of gauging the audience's reaction to the film, I think. Part of what people, like, you know, like it's a fantastic animation and story and everything. I think part of why people enjoy it is because they don't really expect to come into a film about a seagull and a drone and feel so emotional about them at the same time. Moments in the film where people are laughing and, you know, I, there was probably somebody in the audience crying, when, you know, like toward the end of the film. And yeah, I think that's just part of what people enjoy. They don't, they don't expect to get so emotional about something that, yeah, like seagulls. Normally it's just like a pest on the beach. Yeah, I've, I've been very, very happy to hear that quite a few people have, have reached out and said that I've changed their perception of seagulls. Now they think <laughs> twice about them or, you know, they, they, <laughs> and I'm, I'm just like, yeah, that was one of our yeah, goals and like, you know, the fun challenge of it making audiences sympathize with this bird that not a lot of people like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then you were saying at one of the, at one of the festivals that you've like become obsessed with seagulls a bit, huh? Yeah. I, cause I started, when I started directing this film, I started just trying to observe them because I was like, you know, I, I need to, to get a sense of, of what they look like and how they move. Mm -hmm. And 
So I'd start recording them every time I saw them, like in the city or at the mm-hmm. beach when I was at Roto. I would just be yeah recording seagulls everywhere, and then I would just yeah the more I the more like I observed them and and watched them, I just started to adore them, and and I got excited every time I saw one. So <laughs> yeah, now I, now I love them. Although I will say I've never been personally victimized by a seagull and had anything taken from me. So okay, you know maybe yeah. I'm, I'm also lucky in that respect. Maybe so that's probably also <laughs> part of why. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm fond of them still. <laughs> Have friends and family been giving you lots of like seagull related presents? I have more been buying seagull related things myself. Yes, I have, like <laughs> some socks and like a seagull, like a bird, like a. It looks like it could be seagulls, like a shirt mm. that I'm, I'm I've been wearing to a few of the bird drone screenings. But I did buy like during the process, I saw a seagull themed glasses case that I bought for our writer Claire so yeah I'm just if I, if I see any more I'll be, I'll be spreading the love <laughs> <laughs> especially when you're making a project I guess for that time it consumes you and so yeah could you walk us through the timeline of making this film how long did it take for the script to be written and then you know all the way up until completion we pitched in 2020 to Screen West through like for the Elevate initiative for that I made some materials and and some things to for the application process and about mm-hmm. like vision and that thing and then yeah. once we got the funding we developed that a little more and then we started the script development process and so we were able to get a really fantastic script editor on board well he's a like a writer director but he's his name is Bradley Slave and he's just incredible mm-hmm. and so it was Bradley Claire our writer and I on like Zoom calls in the beginning of 2021 yeah it was just a really a lovely experience i think that lasted maybe for like in total like I don't know, a month or two and would go back and forth and then claire would go and, and add and edit her scripts and then yeah we did that a few times and then once that script development part had, had been completed then the script went over to me and then Hannah and I really, I guess, took it from there and went into production. And yeah, we definitely did not expect it to take so long. Part of the journey of it as well was trying to find an animator because I wasn't planning on animating the film. I was only going to be com- coming on board as a director. And so for a variety of reasons, we ended up like yeah, I guess electing to go with me animating it, even though like I genuinely did not think I would be able to do it. There were like so many elements that I'd never ever like touched before, and so <laughs> it was daunting. But also definitely an uh, opportunity to really elevate myself and to you mm. know learn learn new things. So yeah, that's pro- probably also partly why it took so long. So it was supposed to take one year, I ended up taking almost three, and then yeah, and then we would make adjustments as well and, and Hannah and I we navigated the story together. I was like was going into a different direction and then finally settled into to where we liked it, I guess yeah, towards the end of last year. So, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, cool, cool. How many animations have you made before this one? You know, even if even just the little ones that you would have done just at home or whatever it might be? Maybe like six, I wanna say, five or six. I yeah. have to yeah, my memory is awful, so I don't know how accurate this, but I think yeah, probably around that that number. And so yeah, this was just like a really great opportunity for me to like work with a crew properly and also you know like a, have a budget as well because all my previous yeah. were just independent ones, you know, that I created yeah. on my laptop. And even though Birdrun was the same in terms of you know me just making it on my laptop, having just the experience to work with a writer, mm-hmm. producer, composer, sound designer, character designer, mm-hmm. you know, all of those amazing people definitely was a whole different kind of experience. So. I've always been curious about animation, but I've never really touched it except for a couple of little, like, you know, Lego stop motions when I was little or something. <laughs> Could you walk us through the process of making an animation? Because, like, you know, I know with live action, you know, you have the pre-production, then you film everything, and then you edit the thing. W- what is it like for an animation? Yeah, well, that's... I'm really glad they asked that, because before Bird Drone, all my previous ones, I had not done, like the proper process that you do with animation. And so this was like a really good experience for me to go through, like, because it was more structured in that sense. So Mm -hmm. typically with animation, so going from the screenplay, at least my understanding of it is that you would then make a storyboard. So that's what we 
just made thumbnail sketches mm -hmm. based on what I saw for the for the film in my mind. And then mm -hmm. from that, I then turned it into something called an animatic, which is like a moving version of the storyboard. Like you, you yep. watch it as a video and then you might put temp sound or temp music to it. Yeah, and it's like a, a black and white sort of thing and then you can, so you can play with it. And just because animation is so expensive, the animatic is definitely a really good way to test if something's working and and there were, we made so i made so many animatics like i don't know probably, probably like 40 plus in total like there were <laughs> a lot of different iterations and what you're supposed to do is like once you're happy with the animatic then you lock it off and then you actually start making the animation then animation production happens depending on what style you know the compositing and and different kind of stages and, and elements coming together and then you know with post and sound and music because it took us a long time to settle on the story and and, and where it was going to go i was still making animatics like a long way in into production like i, <laughs> I was still we were testing like different endings like it was really yeah. so I also was working on project at the same time because I knew that would take a long time as well. So it was like both happening at once. And so, yeah, I'd, I'd be chipping away at it, but also going back and forth with Hannah and, and then, you know, creating another animatic and we'd talk about it and we'd test it on people and see, see how they were also reacting. So, yeah, yeah it definitely blurred between pre-production and production and for this one. But yeah, typically, like, that's, I guess, my understanding of how animations are it's like yeah you have throwboard animatics production and then mm -hmm. you know, post and yeah that's how it all works but so but the interesting thing is that between the difference between live action and animation is that with animation you'd edit the film first mm -hmm. rather than with live action where you have a bunch of footage and then you can like choose bits and pieces of it to edit so with animation yeah. yeah because you're editing it first you have to be very like particular and very yeah specific to be cost effective. Could you tell us a bit about the original version of the story? Because a lot of people will be able to see the, the finished thing, obviously. And I'm, I'm just curious how much of a change it would go. Because I know that the first draft is almost unrecognizable by the time you get to the fin to the you know the final version. And I'm curious what it was like with Bird Drone. Yeah, so there were quite a bit of, I guess, yeah, different versions throughout. So the, the very, very first one which I got which was I think probably about a one pager synopsis of it was pretty like it had of course like the same concept the seagull falling in love with the drone mm -hmm. a lot of the beats were, were there the ending was the main thing that was quite different and the first very first version ended up with a seagull dying in the trunk of a car <laughs> and then during the script's <laughs> development stage it then changed and I think to, it ended up with a seagull and then the drone like just being together with like the halves of food in front of it mm -hmm. but then the, yeah the seagull not really finding love but then yeah it was like that bittersweet ending although i guess as we moved along we were like wondering like whether or not that was also too tragic and mm -hmm. like you know because it is like, like more on the bitter side than than the sweet side and so yeah. <laughs> yeah from there as well because you know we're thinking about like theme and like the messages and you know what we were wanting to say and yeah so then over i guess the course of a few years we, yeah it became more hopeful and mm -hmm. there was this like conversation i had with this incredible guy called elliot dia he's mm -hmm. amazing he's yeah i someone i really look up to and i'm very grateful to have had that conversation with him and then he suggested he, he was like you know i i think this could do with a more hopeful ending and we we're talking mm -hmm. about theme a bit and that was you know towards the end of 2021 and so there were actually still a couple of years until we actually end up finishing the film but mm -hmm. that conversation was really so useful because it really changed my perception of of, of the story and how we're going, going along and i was before that i was quite content with where it was but then once he pointed that out I, yeah, the more I thought about it, I was like, yeah, actually, he's right. And I think we definitely could shift in a more hopeful direction. What that would look like was the challenge. And so definitely a lot of, of versions and, and possible ways we can go about it. One of the possible endings we're discussing was that the seagull ended up with a magpie. Like, it was like, because we were thinking like, oh, it could be, it doesn't have to be a seagull, it could be, it could be anything. And so... Yeah. That was like a very Australian thing. Also because I, just, I saw a picture of a magpie where people said like, 
the white part of the beak looks like a seagull head. So like later on, if you look up magpie beak seagull, like you will see what I'm talking about. But yeah, <laughs> there were like a whole those. Yeah, I can't even tell how many different versions we were playing mm-hmm. with, but it just found it its itself, I guess, in the end. Yeah. And to a place where we were like, yeah, this is this is where it's landing. It's quite a fascinating thing. The first initial thought is is something tragic. Like someone someone pointed this out to me very early on because you know I had written a number of like I don't know short films or whatever it might have been and someone pointed out to me that in every single thing that I've written at the end of it the main character dies and I, and then I looked back at it was like oh my goodness they're right. What what's wrong with me? <laughs> <laughs> and then and then I went, you know, then I went back into a few of those I was like okay, I I need to I need to like fix this. I need to save some of these characters. <laughs> But so, out of curiosity now, what is like the, the balance of your main character dying and not dying in your, in your work? Uh, <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think that any of my characters are currently dying in anything. The, the thought still definitely pops into my head whenever I'm writing, but I, I think I'm able to like pick up, pick up on it now. And I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> right. you know, like people need to actually feel happy at the end of at least some of these films you know so. like when you, i think even when we we're pitching it to screen west at the beginning we were wanting it to be australian take on like the classic pixar short but then with a very like shakespearean tragic ending like that's how we were approaching it i guess that's also, also as well like when you get attached to the characters over time and because like it's become your your baby I'm like glad that it has like a, a happy ending for our character because I also see a lot of myself in him. You're able to channel all, of, all your experiences and your feelings about it into these characters, especially because animation, you know, mm-hmm. we're always exploring human emotions through like usually or like a lot of the time, like non-human characters. So yeah, definitely, definitely has been, been a journey. <laughs> What was your experience like working with Screen West? So for those who are watching that aren't familiar, Screen West is basically a, a, a government organization um, that essentially you know, supports and, and funds local Western Australian filmmakers. What was your experience like working with Screen West and how much input did they have on the overall project? Yeah, we were very, very grateful to have had that opportunity. And of course, there was so, it was so great having that funding and that, that support there. Because of a bunch of reasons, like because COVID, because, you know, this was, I guess, and even after COVID, like a remotely based thing, like I'm based in Perth, our producer Hannah is based in Melbourne for most of the, the time as well. So we're just going to be working on it from here and then us having Zooms or chats and emails and messages. Mm-hmm. And so Screen West left us alone for the most part, which I, okay. I mean, I actually really appreciated that you know, we were able to, we were given that creative space to really work out kind of what we wanted to do. They also have like, you know, so much going on. Like this is just a little short animated film and, you know, they have series and features to, to worry about. So I think in terms of that input, it was pretty minimal. There was like, I think one or two times that they gave us some like notes or, or feedback and we'd just send them out like, you know, animatics here and there as they went along. I think the main one I remember was like just early on in the process when we made one of our early animatics. Well, and also just the feedback as well after we got gotten the application, in, the initial story was like, they said that they felt that the ending was too tragic. I mean, look, they were, they, were, they, were, they were right, I guess. Yeah, good that we also had, had that from them as well. But then the notes about, I guess, the character arc of the bird and also, which, which also ended up being quite relevant to later on, we discovered. So there were like, you know, a couple of notes here and there early on that ended up being something that we'd, you'd like rediscover, you know, years later and we're like, yeah, that was actually, yeah, that was a great note. Yeah, it was very, very like small things here and there and good to have that voice there. And, you know, just, I guess having an, an over, overarching body to, yeah. to just o- oversee it. But yeah, for, for the most part, we were left to our own devices, which I, I mean, really appreciated. You know, I guess when you do get funding from, from someone, of course, like, you know, there's probably different levels of, of input and, and, you know, having to get that checked off. And so I was really grateful to have had a lot of creative freedom there. So yeah, mm-hmm. it, was, it was a good experience. Yeah, it must have been nice because, you know, uh, uh, with the nature of animations, it is usually just a person in a room uh, uh, alone, but it must have, must have been nice to know that there is 
that support there, like if if you needed it, you know. So yes, exactly. Yeah, and then, yeah, and then the, like the last thing was just about like when we sent the film to them, they were like just about credits and just like, oh, can you just mm. add this like intro, you know, thingo, and just you know, and they're like, yeah, sure thing. So yeah, it was all very very nice. Right. Yeah. Lovely. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So, like a n nice, easy process. That's cool. What was the most challenging part of making this film? Probably just because of the time aspect, just the actual animation of it. Learning. I mean, I had never before this like modeled, rigged, and animated 3D characters before, and so mm -hmm. a lot of it was like really learning how to use like Blender, for example, which I found to be like really very intuitive, uh, which mm -hmm. was really great. Just like trying to find the style and and you know what I was looking for, it was definitely a, a trek trying to just uh, chip away at it for such a long period of time. So I think mm -hmm. yeah, what, that was one of the hard aspects of it, and then the other being just like trying to figure out exactly where the story was going to land and what ending we were going to go with and what the, the message was going to be because that was also an equally challenging process trying to figure out like what are we yeah what's the best way for this to, mm -hmm. yeah all unfold so yeah i think figuring out the, those two parts were, were challenging but also really rewarding it was definitely yeah the best learning process mm -hmm. i've had typically like my previous animated films would take like you know several months at most and so this was like three or four times longer than that but also because i was doing it the structured way and so going through that pre-production process and working with with different people all throughout was yeah was was good i'm uh I'm, I'm curious you know because because the film did take you know like a three-year period or something like that I, I i'm curious if there was ever a point where you were like you, you were pretty much over it because you know i've spoken to other filmmakers and the nature of films is that they do take a long time and and while you still have some love for it you do get to a point where you like like, I just, I need this part of my life to be over so I can get to the next thing, you know, that that thing. Did you ever feel that with this one? I was surprised because, like, I actually, because I love the project so much that for most of that period, I actually was, like, pretty, still, like, you know, very passionate about it. I was, like, you know, cool. it was, like, again, because it was, like, my baby, I was, like, you know, really just trying to make it the best it could possibly be. There were definitely times where we felt a bit lost maybe and, and you know, we were unsure about the direction, but I would just keep chipping away and just okay. trying to, to to make it happen. I definitely did feel that though, probably more after we'd finished or like around that period, because I'd been with it for so long, I wasn't even really sure if I liked it anymore or like if it, if it was gonna, like if audiences were gonna resonate with it. I was genuinely, mm -hmm. I was like, I don't even know what to think about this. like. Yeah. You know, it's been so long, and I guess we have to just leave it here mm -hmm. as, as it is. Like this, we, I can't keep working on this for you know years and years. <laughs> because Queen Mouse had also get, given us a deadline, deadline. Like they were like, okay, this you have to deliver it by here. So I was like, okay. okay. So then okay. when we started out and got it out there, I yeah, I really wasn't sure what to think about it, and I honestly was over it. I was like, oh, I don't know. Like yeah, again, just because you're so close to it, it's like so hard to get that objective kind of view. Mm -hmm. To have all this activity around it, like, recently was very, I mean, yeah, I was so, so very grateful and very, very pleased because it definitely, mm -hmm. I guess, yeah, it helps to validate that, that journey and, and just really lovely to know that people are resonating with it. And so, yeah, I'm now, now that people are like, you know, I, I, the, we've gotten good feedback. It definitely made, made, makes me feel better about the film and like, okay, I'm glad, I'm glad that, you know, this is it has had like a a good ha happy ending <laughs> definitely i mean at this stage as well like yeah it's def i i, I do often think about like whether or not i will keep you know adjusting because there are definitely like parts of it that i'm like oh if only i could like spend <laughs> more time on that but i just have to move on and there are other projects to get to so yeah um, I, th I think i heard someone say once yeah. that like a, a film is never finished it's only abandoned you know because there's like oh there, there's my always God, i more love that you said that yeah, like there, there's always more that, that you can do. I, I, <laughs> yes, I'm yeah. not sure who said that quote, but I love that quote because I'm like, yes, I always bring it up because you wow, you you're like we're on the same wavelength here. I think it's such a true quote, like because it's like, yeah, you can keep tinkering with it for mm -hmm. literally forever, and yeah. you know, 
There, there, there can never there be an end. There will always so. be more. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Just oh, at, at, okay, at some that. point, yeah, like at, at some point, even though there's all these things you wish you could do with it, that, yeah, at some point you just have to like, you just have to stop yourself and say, no, like it's finished. I'm, I'm not touching it anymore. Yeah. <laughs> and it's a hard thing. It's a hard thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. And, 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 yeah. and you were saying that you were kind of, you know, you were kind of feeling like over it when you got to the end of the film. And I feel like that makes a lot of sense because like you've just finished putting in all of this work into this movie and and you're done it's it's finished but it's not really finished because mm. there's still so much more that you have to do with actually distributing it yeah yeah exactly that's a whole other world but very all the aspects of it have their own challenges but also they're very rewarding in their own ways so mm -hmm. yes the journey with a yeah, even after you finish it i guess the journey always still Continues. Mm -hmm. With the distribution side of it, did you have much help with that one, or was or were you pretty much left to your own devices for that too, and you just sort of submitted it to here and there? Yeah, well, like yeah, we were also left to own devices, but it was really good because as part of the funding, they had a specific amount of that like set aside mm -hmm. for festival entries, which was okay. yeah, really, I mean, really helpful to help start us off as well because you know they can really add up. So yeah, I'm, I'm, even though. Yeah, distribution was just, yeah, left to us. I mean, I like that, you know, we had that freedom as well to, you know, choose which places we wanted to go. Like, we had that support from them to be able to, to do that. So Bird Drone includes some very high quality animation work. Congratulations on that, by the way. How long did it take for you to learn the skills that were needed for this film? Yeah, well, thank you for your kind words. Part of them were just, I guess, over several years of like learning Adobe After Effects and Photoshop. I mean, those I mean, I've mean, i used for a very long, long time. Well, I mean, well, a few years. Just really getting comfortable with, with, with those kind of programs. And so, yeah, a lot of the aspects of the film, it was already, I already had those the skills developed, but then of course with newer areas like in Blender and trying to work out a lot of the other elements of it, it yeah would probably overall have taken like yeah a year two years just i mean as because i was just learning it as i was going along as it was something get, i didn't yeah. know like, tutorial and just trying to figure it out like what, what what were the softwares needed to make an animation like this like is it pretty much just blender and after effects and that or were there a few others uh, as well yeah so mainly adobe after effects with this plugin called element 3d by video oh. pilot yeah and that was like a really big part of it because then I would like, especially to create the look and the render of like and the feel of it, animating, like modeling and animating in Blender and then importing it into Element 3D and After Effects. And then, yeah, and the Photoshop would be drawing digital elements as well to composite it in After Effects. And then there were also like from like Red Giant to help aesthetically from like the the colors and the, and the feel and the look. Mainly After Effects, Blender, Photoshop, and then Premiere for editing it together. Yeah, like I wasn't actually aware that people used After Effects for that. Like I know it's used for, you know, special effects and stuff like that, but I didn't know it was used for animation. So that's cool. Yeah, I, I had to do a lot of the animation in like Blender and then like export mm -hmm. all of the models as a sequence into After Effects. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I yeah. think the After Effects, yeah, you're, you're right in that it's, more typically used for like maybe like motion graphics and and not so much on the animation side i mean there's like puppeting and depending on the, the plugins that you're using but mm -hmm. i think i've just been so used to using it over years that i'm just like very comfortable in it i love being able to put everything together in it i guess a lot of the programs i use aren't really like super like industry standard i think for like compositing wise i think nuke is probably more used maya for like 3d rather than like blender so you know there's i'm definitely like using the the materials that are like more i guess accessible to me and more, accessible, more comfortable yeah. with but yeah i guess yeah it depends on yeah what what you yeah. need really. i mean i i think that blender and after effects are fantastic like you know blender you know the fact that it's just free and so easy to, easy yeah <laughs> cool we know that you received some financial support from screen west to make the film so what what was the overall budget would you say and are you able to give some rough breakdown as to where the funds are used for this project yeah so our overall budget was 70k which i was like when we first got the funding i was like 
this is insane. It's like such an insane <laughs> amount. Like I, I, from from coming from like no funding at all to that number, I was like, wow. Apart from like my animation side of things, I have no idea how it was like. Like that was all Hannah's like area and yeah. and domain, mm -hmm. and I know very little about finances. <laughs> so I ended up getting for like the like, directing and animating. I think it was about like twenty two k, and then there were like a few thousand for like us to get get like you know resources like a laptop that would actually work. Mm, trying to animate yeah. this film and then like <laughs> software and that thing when you kind of stress it out over to like three years i mean yeah it's definitely it was a passion project for sure how the other funds were distributed i'm sorry i i, I genuinely don't have don't know <laughs> <laughs> having the rest of the funding to be able to pay composer sound designer character designer script mm. editor mm -hmm. both like you know claire that definitely i mean it made all the difference like just ha I could not imagine what this one would look like without that input and their, what they brought to it. Yeah, I was so, so blown away by how perfect they were for it. I'm glad it all managed to, to work out in our, in our budget. <laughs> now you've got a few people, you know, you've got a group of people that you can work with in the future and do something even bigger and better next time. Where do you see yourself in five and even 10 years from now as a- That is a really good question. What would, what's, think... the, what's the ideal future, I suppose? What? Ideally, maybe like five years, I would have liked to, well, really have a lot of experience between animation and live action. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully I would have made a few more shorts by then and also because like, I mean, there's so many stories and ideas that I have and just trying to find the time to be able to make them. Also by then, I hope that we would like have gotten the ball rolling on a feature because my producer, for Bodro and Hannah and I, we have started work on an animated feature film, but it's very early, early, early days. Yeah, we, I mean, we enjoyed working with each other so much that we were like, you know, let's keep doing this for years. So yeah, that was really lovely. And so hopefully that will be, I know, in the works by then. In 10 years time, yeah, I mean, I guess I hope that, hopefully the feature will be done. <laughs> and yeah, I just, like, <laughs> yeah, I just really hope that I am in a position where I'm balancing animation, live action, and just doing works that I, I really resonate with and, and just making films that hopefully touch people and, and have an impact, whether it's in a social development sense or just in, sense of making you feel something that's really what i want to do so yeah, cool. yeah. <laughs> what do you feel has been the most rewarding part of making this film there are a few different very rewarding parts that i'm like it's hard to choose one of them definitely was the experience of working with a crew for the first time on an animated film like just the things that were like just being able to to communicate with them and, and chat with them and, and hear about their input and what they want to bring for example, our composer, Will Hughes, was just amazing. Previously, I'd done composing for my films, even though like, I don't consider myself a musician. So having an actual composer come on board and, and to work his magic was amazing. And then there's just you know, little, little details that you have on the filmmaking experience that just make it really like memorable. So. When I was talking with Will, he brought one of his cellist friends in to do some, like record some live instrumentation for the score. And he was telling me how there was a technique on the cello called seagulls, where they play the cello to sound like a seagull. And so I was like, that is so brilliant. Like we have to include that. And so there's yeah. a part in the film where like this point of view overhead shot of the birds flying and we hear real seagull squawks that are amazing uh, sound designer and recorders, Keith Thomas, he recorded. Um, and then we transition into just the cello seagull squawks. You know, just That's little cool. things like that. It's just like, yeah, I, I, I will I'll always remember that. And just the opportunity to work with such talented people. I'm like, that definitely was super rewarding. Um, and of course, you know, having those connections for, for future, you know, who knows what we'll, we'll work on next. But then I guess the other rewarding part is definitely seeing how people react to the film. Like that screening at WMA was just like the people were like laughing at all the right points and they were reacting. And like, it was just hearing that and being in the cinema where like everyone is like focused on it and focused on this thing that you've, you've, you've made for, you know, 
three years that definitely was like yeah just just seeing people's reactions definitely is a really really rewarding part of, of the process and just you know like i said just because you you know being so close to it not knowing if people will like it people resonate with it the, the fact that you know there are some people who did that that's really makes makes my yeah makes me really happy <laughs> i mean especially like live action when you're on set mm-hmm. with each other all the time and so like there's bonds that you make mm-hmm. very very strong in in uni on like our f- very first like intro to the screen production unit like two of the friends that i've met on that set are like i'm still friends with like you know all these years later so <laughs> definitely a lot of a lot of bonds created during the whole process yeah 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 like you, you work with people for like you know a, a full week or something getting a film done you, you get really close to each other in that time you know you get like you know sound guys hiding under tables while you're eating and whatever else it might be you just get to know each other in like a totally unique way to normal life i suppose yeah 100 percent. Friend, friends for life sometimes <laughs> what is a tip or advice that you would give to someone else who is starting out in film or who is thinking of starting out in film and then as a bonus to that question what advice would you give to someone who's looking to apply to something like screen west advice for someone who's starting out in film i would say to make the most of what's available to us for example with animation even with bird drone there were so many things that i'd never done before and so i would just you know watch tutorials on how to use blender and then from there would then you know play around and, and try and, and work things out and it was like you know really intuitive program and there were so many things that i was like will this work and it did so it was really nice in that that regard and so that's why and especially because it's a free program it's really really accessible and there are a lot of free programs there that you can really yet yeah, make the most of and that will do what you you require what you really need and also on the live action side of things like you know Back, what, ten, over 10 years ago, when I was like, you know, recording my like laptop web cam. Now we've got phones, which, you know, entire, you know, feature films have been shot on. If you've got a phone, you can start recording and start making films. As part of like WMA, there's, there was even the like filmmaking section where like, you know, the only screen films that were shot on smartphones. And there are a lot of festivals out there as well, which like specifically target those kind of things. So yeah, I would just say, whether it's like, you know, you're working on things yourself or you have a group of friends which, you know, you're all really creative and you want to get into the space just to start making products together and and learning from there because that's, you know, where the experience comes in. And then with the second part of the question, was that for applying for funding? Is that... Yeah, yeah, applying to things like ScreenWest because I know that for some people that can sometimes be a, a bit of a daunting process. Oh, 100%, yeah. I would suggest, like, being really strategic about what you are i guess bringing to the funding body and like what you will gain out of it so for example with bird drone through the elevate plus initiative it was like you know to support emerging filmmakers and so Mm -hmm. claire hannah and i when we applied we had had that you know a bit of a little bit of experience in in film and to, to varying levels that was like you know like the first step but also it was an opportunity for Hannah and Claire to do an animated film because they'd never done that before. And also an opportunity for me, as someone who has done an animated film but hadn't really worked with a crew before, you know, that was another thing. So it was, we definitely very clearly presented how it would upskill ourselves and what mm-hmm. this opportunity would bring for us. Yes, yeah, so that was part of it. But yeah, the, the process was definitely very, very daunting. I remember after we initially, the application process, we initially got past the first round there was like an interview round and I was so nervous I was in this room I like, put on a suit <laughs> like for this like because I think it was like COVID time so you know we uh, took yeah. on this like webcam like a zoom interview and yeah it was but no it went went, went pretty smoothly and we're very very so yeah lucky to have gotten through and thinking that through thinking about what and who you were applying together with but also what I think what also really helps is like making sure you have prepared materials for your project. So going into the application process, we put together a bunch of different documents. And I think some of them are required that you need to do anywhere, like, you know, director's vision statement and, you know, 
all, all these kind of different things but also you know I, I mocked up some sketches of how the film might look or the characters and you know mm -hmm. put that in a document and send that through as well so really showing that you are already working on it or thinking about it and that's you know to, to them i mean i guess they must have seen that as like oh cool like this is now i know a better idea of, of what it's going to look like or you know that they're really you know trying to get this off the ground so yeah i guess that would also be really helpful so i'd, I'd suggest that as well if it's like live action as well pretty like under a pitch deck or you know just anything that would help them uh, get a sense of what you're trying to make very last thing yeah i guess tell people what it is that you plan for the future what's your next project coming up if you've got one uh, yeah just tell us anything that you want yeah so my next project that i'm currently working on is another short animated film it's very different from bird drone it's a dark fantasy animated mm -hmm. film that explores some of my mental health struggles over the past few years and being diagnosed with ocd and and i think there's a lot of aspects of ocd that i think generally a lot of people aren't like aware about or like you know there's aspects of it that i really want to explore that i've actually dealt with but you know in a more creative format and so mm -hmm. yeah that's this next film it's this very strange eclectic film but very excited to get that get that out there so that's what i've i'll be continuing to work on for probably the next several months don't want to spend another three years <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. so yeah <laughs> Hopefully it will be a, a bit a bit faster this time. <laughs> are, are you going to try to get some help with animating? The style of animation, I really is like also something I really want to learn, like or just like have more experience with because it's like also yeah. very different from Bird Ride. And also because it's such a personal story, I'm like, you know, I feel like I can. Like, this is like more feasible kind of to do within my right because the film, the concept is about me, a version of me who revisits his younger self to trade cards, among other things. And it's like the style of it, I'm thinking is like very, like kind of using colored pencils and fine liners and like the materials that I would have used when I was like in that age to, do, to draw. And so, yeah, I think because it is such a personal film, animation wise, I'll probably be undoing it myself. Also because we don't have funding behind yeah. us as well so you know there's, yes. there's that part of it too i am like you know working with our like, crew members like so for example music wise a uh, local composer uh, called nick gardener or nicholas mm -hmm. gardener and he uh, i'm so so excited to work with him i stumbled across his website um, when i was looking for composers and i was like blown away so i like emailed him asked like hey i've got this project would you be interested in coming <laughs> on board and he, he like, very thankfully said yes and so yes really excited and then you know we'll be working with Saudis and you know I guess it will be like continuing that crew based process that I started with by drone and so final final question how can people find you I have I'm on Instagram at Rodea underscore J and I also have yeah I guess a Twitter slash X I have a website but also like a YouTube channel so I think some of my work is posted there yeah that's like pretty much it like and I have a website as well which also yeah it's Rodea.net Kind of has my work and whatever is available i'll put a plenty of links in the description so that people can find you that way as well thank you for taking out some time on your weekend to have a good chat i, I always quite enjoy just you know just getting into the the nitty-gritty details of, of filmmaking and especially animation because for me that's that's new and i've learned a lot through this, this through this interview so thank you oh, no, thank you so much for having me and for this lovely chat and you know for your very for your great questions because there were a lot of aspects that about bird drone that I'd never been able to share before so really cool that we were able to kind of get into those details and to strip back some of the layers i hope to see you around and i'll i'll keep an eye on your socials and your future projects as well but yeah again thank you and yeah i'll i'll see you in the future amazing right back at you and yeah thank you thank you so much again <laughs>